Welcome to our Saturday simulcast. And it is Saturday in the Eastern time zone as we record this. No, it is not. It's Friday. I'm so screwed up on the dates. It's uh, New Year's Eve, I guess. And that's just several hours after Purdue's momentous, I don't know what other adjectives or words that you wanted to describe, Purdue's 48 to 45 overtime win in the Music City Bowl. That victory gives the Boilermakers a nine-win season. And uh, we'll be talking about that. Uh, uh, I don't know. This could go on for hours, the way this game went out. But I want to thank our sponsor, the Union Club Hotel and the 811 Restaurant as well. Uh, we appreciate you and we appreciate all you've done for us in 2021 as we bring 2021 to a close. And at least for Purdue fans, Tom, uh, I don't know. It, it uh, you know, it wasn't a perfect game by any stretch, but it was an amazingly uh, entertaining game. You know, just for a fan, you know, on Bowl Week to tune in and watch a great college football game with all that drama. And if you're a Purdue fan, it was even even more to the case. Just an unreal win for Purdue. Yeah, a lot of back and forth, obviously. And, you know, guys, we heard so much in the lead into of this game about the up-tempo Tennessee offense, about how they jump on opponents quickly right out of the gate. And sure enough, right? According to script, <laughs> yeah. You look up from your computer. It's twenty-one to seven, Tennessee, in the first quarter. You go, my gosh, Purdue's worst fears are, are being realized here. But amazingly, uh, the defense took those punches. Right, second quarter, I think they gave up. They only gave up no points in the second quarter. I think less than a hundred yards of offense to Tennessee. Actually, had the lead at halftime after falling behind twenty-one to seven. So. I know this defense took a lot of body blows against Tennessee, gave up a lot of yards, a lot of points. But I was thinking this to myself walking back from the stadium tonight, you know, when, when, when it came time to make that one, one big stop, to make that one big play, the defense rose to the occasion, right? And time and again, fellas, before we came on camera, I was talking to Brian, time and again in the course of this game, the defense got the offense the ball several times with the lead, with the chance to extend the lead, and the offense wasn't able to capitalize. So I know if you look, again, just look at the black and white, it doesn't look pretty, but I thought by and large, given what this defense had going against it with personnel losses, I thought it, I thought it ended up performing pretty well. Yeah, Brian, and you know, I'll get to you, Brian, but you look at these names here, and of course the guy you've been talking about all year with Chris Jefferson, 15 tackles. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Prince Boyd Jr. with five tackles. I mean, guys that just haven't uh, haven't been part of uh, part of this uh, defense. Uh, a Jeff Mark sighting with two tackles. I mean, just all <laughs> important plays uh, in a situation where Purdue needed ev all of that. Yes, it might be the best performance I've ever seen when you give up 670 yards or whatever it was. <laughs> it was unreal from that standpoint. But you have to give Purdue's defense credit because I think it's the only way they get back in the game. Tennessee actually officially 663 yards. The only way that Purdue gets back in this game is by shutting them out in the second quarter. I mean, and the fact that uh, Purdue gets gets back and has the lead at halftime, I thought was pretty remarkable. Brian, you were out doing other important things today and obviously got a chance to watch the game, but we're watching us uh, high school basketball and Purdue basketball commits. Uh, but uh, this was a remarkable game, and, and give us what your perspective was and, and, and your ability to watch it and see what uh, you saw in the, in the Purdue win. Yeah, just an unbelievable culture game for Purdue um, in terms of it's to the point now where when people say it's next man up in press conferences, we just roll our eyes because the <laughs> yeah. meaning has been completely drained from that term because it doesn't right. mean anything. Cause when you just say it all the time, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. But for Purdue to have won this game, playing the guys they were playing, I know nobody wants to focus on who they didn't have, but too bad. This wasn't just George Karloftis and David Bell. Branson Dean was a huge loss. Greg Long was a huge loss. Dedrick Mackey was a huge loss. The list, Milton Wright was Milton an Wright, enormous yeah. loss. Yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot about him. For Purdue to, to do this, throwing the ball to Colin Sullivan in late in the fourth quarter. Colin Sullivan <laughs> 
hadn't caught a pass all year. He barely played all year. Deion Burks makes an enormous catch. Jeff Marks, Prince Boyd, those guys barely played all season long. Um, Joseph Anderson, I think, was out there, made a big play. Right, He's Barely right. played all year. Uh, for Purdue to do this, this was the epitome of what they mean when they say next man up. It, it, it's not that trite little cliche that nobody really pays any attention to when somebody says it because it's just part of the landscape nowadays. Um, but it's about being ready. And when you're ready, playing your butt off when you have your opportunity. And that's precisely what, what all of these guys did today. This was for Purdue's defense. This was what they signed up for was we're going to give up yards. We're going to give up points, but we're going to go down swinging. And that's precisely what happened. But what I meant before, when I said this was a big time culture game for Purdue, yeah. Purdue showed a mentality in this game that you could build a program around. If this is what you get, if you get to the point where this sort of thing is what defines you, the sort of resilience Purdue showed today, the sort of readiness, all of these guys who barely played all year show that is something that becomes identity and then becomes your program. Just a really unbelievably impressive win for Purdue. And I'm trying not to overstate it, but hmm. it's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's hard to understate it. Yeah, I think that's the true thing. You know, you look at the, some of the great victories, and we won't necessarily go into that list. But one guy that I think, I don't know, Brian you use the term epitomize, whatever, whatever, what he was, Brock Thompson. I mean, here's a guy that's going to have surgery on both legs has gone through the personal challenges of his, fam his family illness, moved back here, really didn't get used that much this year, in all honesty. Uh, he was dealing with injuries, uh, made some plays. But today, not only does he – he sets the all-time uh, Purdue Bowl record with 217 yards in receiving and made just – and really made – yes, he made the, the long touchdown pass in the fourth quarter, but his touchdown reception – to answer uh, Tennessee in the first quarter, to at least slow them a little yeah. bit, was huge as well. I mean, again, Tom, I, you know, and, and Brian's right, it's, but it's hard not to understate this because what he did was just unbelievable today, making uh, challenge catches or jump ball catches uh, on two bad wheels is uh, going to go down in history, really, at Purdue is one of the great performances of all time. Yeah, boy, uh, Purdue needed it, obviously. Jeff Brom talked about that. He was asked about Brock Thompson, obviously, and he, he basically said he had no choice. But he had to play. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, they were they were uh, at the bottom of the proverbial barrel, if you will. And, you know, Brock Thompson, anybody who talks to Brock Thompson <clears throat> comes away very impressed. Um, he seems like the kind of person who has his priorities in line, very much a hard worker, super humble, uh, comes from a family that's very, uh, I think, it's really instilled that in him—an athletic family uh, <clears throat> with a father who played pro baseball, obviously. So, Brock's dialed in and, and a hard worker and a no-nonsense guy. And, and I, now, we were always told he was a leader from the day he got on campus. They started talking about him being a leader when we were at Big Ten Media Day. Yeah. He'd only been on campus for a few weeks, probably by, by then, maybe. So that that tells you a lot <clears throat> about Brock Thompson right there. And you're right, Alan. I'm sure it was painful for him not to get the chance to, to play or get a whole lot of catches this year. Um, but David Bell, Milton Wright, obviously take up a lot of those. But he never says a peep. He just keeps working hard. And he was rewarded today. And he certainly um, is probably going to have a big role going in next year, too, fellas. And, and um, <clears throat> real quick, too, tight end Payne Durham, right? We all knew the yeah. tight ends. All the tight ends were going to have to have a big day today. And Payne Durham <clears> – <throat> A 62-yard catch he had, uh, just a high, highlight real moment. And uh, shedding tacklers, tiptoeing down the sideline to pay dirt. I mean, uh, just a, a signature play for a great guy, too. And, um, boy, Payne came up big, and Purdue needed him to deliver. He also, I think, caught the two-point conversion pass right there. Right, it was a huge play, huge play. Yeah, so Payne Durham, boy, he's coming back next year with Garrett Miller, who made this Superman catch today. Um, but he's going to have uh, two very good tight ends once again next season. You know, Brian, you talk about this, and, and you've written about it also, looking at where this program in 2019 and 20, and I'm not saying it's hard for us to evaluate, truly evaluate leadership or what's going on in the locker room. But one thing that seems like you talk about building programs, one thing that seems pretty clear, at least if you listen to what Jeff Brown 
Tom has to say. He talks about Payne Durham being one of the best leaders he's had. And Durham, I think, if I under if I heard it yeah. right on his radio show, radio post game radio, he said Durham was battling illness, whatever, not COVID apparently, and he was you know not a hundred percent. But you know you've got guys, and obviously Jackson Anther who'll be gone, and finally I guess, but sadly because what a finish he had as well. But just that leadership quotient of a you know you, you made a maybe you made a leader out of a guy like George Karloftis too. I mean a guy that came in. Uh, and I guess that's what I'm saying in terms of culture and move. You know, you cover this and men's basketball, and you got a men's basketball program that's got great culture. I didn't see Jeff Brom's program necessarily developing that, but now you know you have to look at it and say, my gosh, you got you got some guys that are got to be great locker room people, and 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 a win like today really helps. I mean, Brian, is that a oversimplification, or is that uh, that that uh, what you see might be reality? Yeah, no. I think Purdue obviously has some guys. I think I think Jackson Anthrop's been an unbelievable example setter. Um, it was interesting to hear what Brock Thompson said about Jackson Anthrop in that press conference. That was that was unsolicited. Uh, he just kind of brought that up. That was one of the most memorable things I think I've heard said in a post game press conference in some time. Of course, post game press conferences kind of are what they are sometimes, but. Um, I think Brock Thompson's becoming that guy, just an unbelievable example. I spent all year long picking him as my pick to click in those stupid predictions posts we do every Friday because I thought he had a certain energy about him, a certain kind of something about him that I always figured any week now he's going to have that game. And I finally move off him, uh, and (laughs) sure enough. But that was... I mean, that, that performance by Brock Thompson today is something that they should be showing on that loop uh, in the football office that yeah. is, is playing 24 hours a day because that was that was Jake Taylor at the end of Major League beating out the bunt, you know? <laughs> like, you were just watching him run on two bad legs and just marveling at what this kid was doing. I mean, if there was ever a, you know, a – personification of rising to the occasion against all odds this was it and you know I don't know exactly what people mean when they say you know a Purdue guy a boilermaker whatever term you want to use but yeah I think generally speaking toughness and grit and all of that stuff you know is probably part of it and I I, I can't imagine a, a gutsier you know performance by um anyone more than what you saw from from Brock Thompson today he may as well have been pushing around that field on one of those little scooters <laughs> yeah well and then it brings it to the other good leader which is the quiet leader and you know you watch uh, Aiden O'Connell and Aiden O'Connell as we've talked about I think before we started the show wasn't perfect today he in he might have built a case a little bit he might have even pressed a little bit on a couple of his interceptions. But again, here's a guy that was, as they were talking about in the broadcast, and Brian, I think, was the only guy that ever wrote an article about him a couple of years ago, and or in 2019, I should say, you know, about this guy really might be able to play someday. And I don't know, where, where do you start with him? I mean, he was just, again, I know he wasn't perfect today, and he missed, he missed some passes that I think he'd like to have had back, or he might have thrown for 700 yards today. But again, he made play after play when he had to make them. And that's been the story of Aiden O'Connell's season. And it's almost a, it's almost a uh, mythical when you talk about what this guy has accomplished. And he's got another encore performance in 2022. He's like produced Kurt Warner, right? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just go ahead and say he worked at Hy-Vee, sack and groceries too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great story. Uh, another chapter, five touchdown passes. The interceptions, <laughs> we can all agree they were ugly. First picks, though, since October 23rd against yeah. Wisconsin when we also threw three interceptions. And, again, you guys talked about it. Ryan did, too, off camera. Maybe he was trying to do too much. Uh, maybe he felt obliged, like he had to carry the load today. And, and uh, But, again, yeah, he did have his, his bumps. But, by and large, he was Aiden O'Connell. And uh, we know what makes him special. And, you know, I, I was thinking, too, on the offense. A couple of times I looked up. And at the offensive line, and there was one point the left side of the offensive line 
had two true freshmen. Yeah. On the goal line. <laughs> yeah. Bruce and Bo, unbelievable. So those guys were seeing some quality snaps. Eric Miller had gotten dinged up, and they had to shuffle around the line there for a little while. So, yeah, kudos to that line. Only gave up two sacks, I think, to Dayden O'Connell. He was largely able to work, for the most part, unfettered, which obviously always does help. So, yeah, again, I wanted to mention the two freshman offensive linemen. And I'm just hopping back to the defense real quick, too, guys. Sanusi Kane. Yeah. When we talked about Diedrich Mackey, a 12-game starter, was not available today. And that thrust Sanusi Kane to play the cornerback role today. And I thought he performed pretty well, honestly. Those are three pretty good Tennessee wide receivers there. They're going to make their plays. But I thought Sanusi Kane acquitted himself pretty well. And, uh, you know, we ought, we also have to talk about the kicker, right? I mean, you know, four field goals today. Uh, Mitchell Fenron, 39-yard game winner. The guy started off like a house of fire, hit a little bit of a blip midseason, battled through that, finished very strong, guys. I think he's 25 or 29 on the year. And, again, I thought at one point when Purdue was kicking those field goals, I, I said to myself, they're going to end up regretting this at some point. And uh, it didn't end up costing them. They needed the points. But then again, Fenron at the end of the game comes through in the ultimate pressure situation, guys. That's basically a road game, overtime, 39 yards away, and he nails it to win it. So, uh, again, another another good guy. If you ever talk to Mitchell Fenron, you come away very impressed with, with uh, that Sanford transfer. You know, you look at that, and we're not apologizing – for a off, quote unquote, off, unquote, day for Aiden O'Connell, 26 to 47, 534 yards, only two yards short of his career high and 12 yards short of a Purdue Bowl and all time record, I should say, uh, which I think was set by Curtis Painter. Uh, five touchdowns, five touchdowns, yes, three picks, only 55%. So, so his, uh, his completion percentage did go down. Ever so little amount, but uh, that uh, that I think is a thing. And you watch him on, the, you know, I think went back and watched the fourth quarter replay again. He just he doesn't have hardly any reaction. Now he does put his hand on the helmet when he knows he's throwing a bad pass. He kind of raises his hands up and kind of rubs his head a little bit. But boy, that guy is just stoic and just just plays moving it forward. And I think it has to have a calming effect uh, when you're a when you're a Colin Sullivan coming into a game or, uh, or Deion Burks or whatever, uh, you're coming in ex- and, and you don't know which end is up and you got a guy like that in your huddle. It's got to help. So that, uh, that to me was, it was an extremely impressive thing. All right. I've never been to seen a game. I think we did the count. I did the count post game, six pass interference penalties against uh, uh, Tennessee, 14 penalties all, all told a huge factor in the game. And you're going to hear a lot in the next week. If you turn on Tennessee media uh, and not all of it's wrong, uh, you know, obviously some tough calls there. There was a, t- you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of discussion, Brian, on the a play that you didn't see. So you can get to, in real time, you didn't get the chance to see overtime, but the whistle in the end zone or when, excuse me, in the overtime when they did not get in the end zone, it was before progress was stopped and it paved the way for the Purdue game winning field goal. But one of the things I think you did see that surprised me that Tennessee didn't do in its last chance when it had the 56 yard field goal attempt at the end is they had a couple chances to really improve their field goal position yeah. or their field position and, and have a much shorter field goal and didn't do it. Uh, that was yeah. a surprising thing as well, but it's a game of unbelievable storylines, Brian. Yeah. I'd be interested to know um, how much of that was, on the quarterback because they had yeah, that no. they had that one-on-one coverage up top all day pretty much because Purdue was playing man and that's a pretty big advantage for Tennessee and I'm I'm sure it's a hard one to to turn down when it's there no but good, no doubt it did um it did uh um seem to not make a whole lot of sense that they weren't trying to play for that field goal at the end by by 
hitting hitting a few passes to the sidelines or whatever. Time was on their side, wasn't it? If, if I recall yeah. correctly, and they had three timeouts. They, they had yeah. they had all their time. That was so, was so funny about the last five minutes of the game was they scored like eight touchdowns without anyone using a timeout. Um, but yeah, uh, Tennessee, I thought made some tactical errors. <laughs> you know, I, I I thought not taking the field goal in overtime was insanity. I could I guess I could see it both ways, but I, I just don't see how you anyone in any game ever just says, okay, we're going to put our defense on the field and they have to prevent a field goal to win this game. I mean, when you're starting at the 25 yard line, you're pretty much asking for pushing them backward, blocking the kick or getting a turnover. And if somebody just needs a field goal, they're not going to do anything outside the ordinary and run the risk of turning the ball over anyway. So I I just, I, I did not understand not taking the points there. That, that seemed like uh, a testosterone call um, <laughs> on Josh Heupel's part. Perhaps if the stadium wasn't full of orange, uh, you know, perhaps he might have he might have thought differently about that and uh, not let Hubris take over there. But I thought Tennessee did produce some favors uh, with all the with all the penalties, with some some of the, the decisions we just we just discussed. Um, I thought Tennessee did produce some favors, but that doesn't take anything away from what Purdue did. Uh, obviously, um, you know, Tennessee helped give Purdue an opportunity to win the game. Purdue had to go out and win it. That's exactly what they did. Yeah, you know, you look at this, and, and I, in my position during the game in the radio booth, you have an open air. So you could, it was intense. I mean, I, I thought the crowd was extremely loud. Uh, it was like a, a playoff, you know, NFL playoff type environment. No, the fans stood the whole game. I mean, the Purdue section that darn near stood the whole game it was just a, an extremely intense atmosphere and when you talk about a music city bowl record of 69,000 or wherever they were and about 62,000 of them were, were in orange and you know it just uh, that just adds to what a, the story of this season which really ends up being five wins away from Ross H Stadium no Purdue team has won that had won four in the regular season away from Ross State Stadium since 1943. So, uh, again, a milestone year. And as we kind of start start to wind our way down to the end of this podcast at at uh, one o'clock in the morning Eastern time, uh, you know that's a storyline that again, Brian, I thought hit it hit the nail on the head, Tom. About talk about things that you can build a program around. You win and went and won in a, in a road game environment today without question. Uh, and you also won the games that you won uh, at, at, uh, uh, at Iowa, certainly, and, and Nebraska, some tough games on the road that got the job done. Uh, again, this will be a memorable, was a memorable 2021, but a memorable end to the 2021 season. You know, the, to just uh, to see so, – and Brian talked about it earlier, too, I think you did too on the roll call of guys that they had to use today. And not only did those guys play, but, but they contribute. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, even for those players, guys, even for Joe Anderson, a, 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 a Jeff Marks, <laughs> to what that does for that guy's confidence to know that he's really as, as a valued member of the team and he got a chance to contribute just goes miles and miles. And, and it, 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 it adds more value to wherever the coaches are telling those guys in July and August about always being ready, always being prepared. We need you. And those words don't ring hollow when you got tangible evidence of, of, of yes, this does come to fruition and we do need you and you can't be a valuable, valuable member of the team. I think everybody wants to feel like they're, they're needed and they belong. And boy, everybody got a chance to do that today. And with one of the biggest wins in recent school history. And guys, I don't know about you, but as far as bowl game wins go, I can only think of one that was more exciting than this. It was the 98 Alamo Bowl. Um, you guys may disagree, but that was a number five ranked Kansas State team that should have been playing for the national title. And uh, a lot of theatrics in that game, too. Not to take any shine off what happened today, but it's always kind of fun to look back and think, where does this win rank in other in the history of Purdue bowl games? And certainly that, that game in, in San Antonio 23 some odd years ago still rings very special for me too. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I put it on top of it, but it's equal or close to it, of course. Now, you know, are the, 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 we talking Isaac Jones. pro Purdue or are we talking just exciting period because oh, we lost a couple of bowl games to Georgia oh, yeah. that would qualify the other <laughs> yeah. side of the coin there? <laughs> oh, no doubt. So you bring no up doubt. that 2000 Outback Bowl, but no win, wins, Brian. <laughs> I mean, you, you were probably in San Antonio for that Alamo Bowl, weren't you? Never got to the Alamo Bowl. Yeah, I, was. I, I was. I was on the sidelines, I think, when – when uh, when Jones because I could I got blocked I couldn't tell that he caught the ball from uh, from Drew Brees but yeah this is this goes down there is uh, got and asked that several then, times as well and, look, and, then, and, then, and then look what Purdue did in 1999 and 2000 that yeah. was quite a stepping stone for the program at that point obviously I'm not saying Purdue is necessarily going to get to that level but why not you know I think they uh, they have a good chance to be a legit Big Ten West contender next year guys. I know a lot of – we're a long way from September. Uh, but since we're in the media, we get to look ahead, right? Yeah. I, you know, just with just the fact that Aiden O'Connell is back, to me, is going to put Purdue right in the thick of that. We, we've talked about the schedule already before, guys. It's advantageous, too. So um, we can already start hyping up 2022 if we want. But um, O'Connell's return certainly is going to bring a lot of shine, a lot of energy, and a lot of excitement to this program next year. Yeah, no Ohio State, no Michigan, no Michigan State on the schedule next year. Michigan State obviously won its bowl game today also in come from behind fashion over Pitt. <laughs> but this is a, uh, yeah, it, it does lead you. In, it was almost like a spring game in some ways because you were looking deep yeah. in the roster to figure out where you were. Uh, but again, going back to the kind of trying to tie this all together, Brian, that, that foundation and that ability to not only, you know, think about this, guys, and I'm sure you already have, just the transfer portal. This was an audition of, uh, you know, a, a game that nobody else, everybody in the country is watching. If you're watching football today, yeah. uh, I would think Purdue would, have, would, would be in a good situation if there was a couple guys out there that want to be really good receivers. Uh, and the good thing also for Purdue is, yeah, there'll be life after David Bell because because they'll have several guys that were injured this year return. But uh, I'm circling down to something here, Brian, and that is, is it as simple now that you get back to – you can throw anybody out there and still throw for 536 yards? Yeah. Uh, that's a good thing. I, I know it's not that simple, but uh, it has to be a good sign, again, if you're talking about building a program. Yeah, no, I, I think – I don't think you can throw anyone out there and throw for 500 yards. I think, you know, produce a quarterback school with a quarterback coach and all of that stuff. But I think the thing about this game, you know, the, or the, the thing about Aiden O'Connell is we talked about him earlier coming from where he came from. You know, how many times did we hear eighth out of nine or whatever? And he had to be a yeah. scout team wide receiver just to practice. But um, this wasn't just a walk on becoming a starter. This was a walk-on becoming Purdue's guy, you know, Purdue's foundation here. I mean, they went into this game, and this was, hey, no, Connell, you have to go win us this game <laughs> because we're going to throw it everywhere. Most of our best players aren't playing today. Um, go win the game. And I think that's what he walks into next season. I think <laughs> him coming back next year, puts Purdue right back in that category they're in right now where, hey, anything's possible because you have your guy, you have your quarterback. And it wasn't this way for half the season. I remember writing many times, uh, Purdue has quarterbacks you can win with, but you won't win because of. And right now that looks like the stupidest thing I've ever written. I've written some dumb stuff in my career yeah. a lot every day. Um but this is also validation of the Brahms. This is also what was promised when Jeff Brom was hired, brought his brother with him, that, hey, we've got quarterback whisperers here. We've got, a, we've got guys who know how to coach quarterbacks, who know how to put them in positions to be successful. And at some point this season, they figured this out too, and they started putting Aiden O'Connell in really good positions. They started scheming better pass protection uh, they started getting him uh, stuff that was allowing them to be really successful throwing the ball down the field. Next year, you're going to have receivers back. 
you know, hopefully for everybody involved, you have Milton right back. Hopefully Mershawn Rice can actually stay on the field for a whole season. That poor kid. Brock Thompson's not going to be running on wooden legs anymore. Uh, presumably, you know, Payne Durham's back. Garrett Miller's back. Uh, TJ Sheffield's back. You're going to have some weapons around Aiden O'Connell. You're in this comfort zone now from a play calling perspective, from an offensive design perspective. He's got to be as comfortable and confident as ever. And he has shown you the value at quarterback of simply a temperament and, and maturity and just being unflappable and things like that. He's got a lot of those intangibles. You're sitting here looking at this season now, next year, you have set a hell of a tone for next year. You have your biggest piece of the puzzle back. There's no reason this can't be a springboard to Purdue being right back here a year ago, a year from now. I'm sorry, it's 12.50 in the morning, and I've, I'm, I'm, I've lost my ability for coherence. <laughs> but I think the one thing Purdue did this season as a team was sort of redefine – I don't want to say redefine possible because they've won games like Iowa and Michigan State and whatnot before – but anything was possible at all times. And I think you go into next season thinking the exact same thing. Uh, I don't think that I don't, I, I wouldn't go into next year thinking there's nobody on that skit. There's anyone on that schedule. Purdue can't beat just like for the most part this season, I thought there wasn't anybody on this schedule. Purdue couldn't beat. didn't mean they were going to beat them all, but I thought they could beat them all. Yeah. It, it all, all positive things. Looking for Tom, we'll give you a sense. You're, you're the guy covering this uh, on a day-to-day basis. The last word as we wrap this up, uh, and uh, and I'm down to six percent on battery, so I better get moving. So you know, to what what you know, let's let's wrap this up and say uh, put put a wrap on this season, 2021. Nine wins, first time since 2003, and uh, really a remarkable year. Yeah, you know, talking to some people down here this week, Tennessee fans or media, I should say. Um, going in, we all thought, man, six and six, just get to a bowl, right? You just got to get to a bowl. Six wins, that's doable. Seven wins, uh, maybe, maybe that's your ceiling. Well, Purdue obviously broke through all that. The nine wins, Alan, we talked about the first time since 2003. So exceeded their expectations. We all knew there was a sense of urgency, I think, this year. After going bowlless two years in a row, uh, the mojo appears to be back. And um, – like I said before, you know, the, the anticipation for next year is going to be uh, pretty great. So, uh, yeah, a, a season that was much needed and a program that I think uh, very much looks like it's on the rise right now. All right. We will wish all of you uh, Happy New Year's Eve and Happy New Year. And a lot, I think 2022 sets up to be an extremely interesting year, not only for the next three months of uh, Purdue men's basketball but what we might see on Labor Day weekend when Purdue opens up against Penn State to open up the 22 season as well. So on behalf of Brian and Tom, I want to wish you all, like I said, Happy New Year. I want to thank our sponsor, and that is, of course, the Union Club Hotel and the 811 Restaurant. We are grateful for them, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with Tom and Brian for another year. A lot of fun to do that. And uh, we'll, in a fun day, if you're a Purdue fan or even if you're just a good football fan, this was a, a, an amazing day that uh, – Purdue fans will not soon forget. So have a great uh, rest of your weekend and then bring in the new year in a good light. And we'll look forward to a great 22, 2022. And thank you all for listening and watching. And we'll see you next week on our next Saturday simulcast.